Today's guest is a world-renowned forensic researcher and criminalist. His career has spanned more than 60 years, and he spent 26 of those years working as Senior Forensic Examiner for Knoxville Police Department in Knoxville, Tennessee. Please help me welcome Arthur Bohannon. Arthur, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. I consider it such an honor that you took time out of your day to come and be a guest on my show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, so I'm really, you know, I've been excited about this for months. You know, Amy set this up months ago, yes. and I have thought about this, and I've been really nervous because, to me, you're such a huge deal. I think to no, everybody, not. you're no, a huge not. deal. So <laughs> so bear with me if my nerves get to me a little bit today. Um, so let's start from the very beginning. Okay, um, I don't want to miss anything, so I'm going to look at my notes here. You are a certified latent print examiner. Retired. Retired, one of only 918 in the whole world. Yes. Yeah, I looked that at the other day. That's yes. extraordinary. Yes. Um, you're a patented inventor. Yes. Inventor. Yes. Um, a researcher. Yes. A police instructor, among many other things, I'm sure. So, what did I leave out? This sounds very tiring, but what did I leave out? The two discoveries. The first one, I discovered that the child's fingerprint before puberty is chemically different. Yeah, I read that. that and at, is... at puberty, it, it changes because at puberty, the human body gets its zits, oils, the hairs, they turn oil base. Before that, it's water base. So on the child, six or seven years old, you work the crime scene, you got to work it completely different because you're working with water instead of oils that stick around a long time. Wow. You know what? How did you how did you stumble upon that? Uh, we had uh, a couple of kids in Oxford that were kidnapped <coughs> and got to car of one of them uh, within a week or 10 days. I couldn't find her fingerprints in it. And I got to wondering about that, and I contacted my friends, the FBI, Scotland Yards, and other people, and no one had an answer. And in, that was in April and in June, we had another one that was kidnapped, taken to Loudoun County, raped and murdered and sodomized. Oh, wow. And I got the car real quick, so I got part of her fingerprints that day and left the rest of them to see how long they survived. Mm -hmm. And the next day, those were gone. Oh, wow, because they were water-based. Water-based. Wow, that's mm -hmm. interesting. So mm -hmm. from that time on, you just... I went into full-blown research. I had a friend at Coca-Cola. He gave me uh, 300 Coke bottles, and I had children and adults to handle the bottles in my laboratory backseat of my Crown Vic. So that's what I did there, and I, I figured out, and I took my project to Oak Ridge National Lab and was confirmed that I was right. There, there was a difference no one looked at it before. Wow. You know, your contribution <laughs> to the world of forensics is, is really extraordinary i mean it really is when i researched you i couldn't believe all the things and i'm like i was i was like lord how does one man have that much knowledge in his head like how do you what do you think about yourself when you look back at your career because it's been more than six decades correct mm -hmm. so what do you think about your your contributions that you've made i'm sure you're proud of yourself i knew at 14 what i wanted to do in life yeah yeah and by the time i was a sophomore in high school i was working for the county sheriff here taking fingerprints and the first case was a Beside the uh, cracker barrel up on the upper end there, I got fingerprints of a kid and matched them up. So that's my first. I was just 18 years old at the time. Yeah, you know, that's what I was going to say. I read that. So you were going to school but taking a class to get your certificate, which was... That was a home study course. Yeah, that was a home study course. But And when you got it, that was... Um, a very coveted certificate it, was. it wasn't just a, a fly-by-night thing it was it very was. coveted was. and so the police really took you serious so much so that they would come get you out of class and take you the sheriff would, to help absolutely. you yeah he did he'd call on the on the phone tell the principal he needed me and a principal get on the pee and tell me bring, come to the office bring my bag so i knew it was going to work yeah oh man i can't imagine that you know being a sophomore in school and being able to do that i read that the only other person at sevier county high school because you are severe severe yeah. severeville yeah. native and the only other person at Sevier County High School to be afforded that luxury, that opportunity, was Dolly Parton yes. when she got to go sing on the Cass Walker show. Yes. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, how did that feel? What did your friends think about you when you would leave, go work at the police, and then come back to school? He's weird. <laughs> <laughs> did they ever want to do? <laughs> you know, nobody bothered me. Uh, you know, uh, looking back, I wonder why they didn't mm -hmm. kind of pick on me. But nobody bothered me. Mm -hmm. They knew what I was doing. Yeah. And nobody bothered me. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. have either. <laughs> And uh, three weeks after graduating from high school, I was in Washington working for the FBI. Wow. Went through their fingerprint school and then in the Army, oh. military police. I didn't like Washington, so I wanted to join the Army and sent me back to Washington. <laughs> or into the cemetery. I scarred on Preston Kennedy's gravesite for a while. Oh, wow. Listen, I'm obsessed with the JFK stuff. I watch every documentary. I read everything. Lie, 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 lie. 
Well, probably, but I, it's so interesting to me. And I went to Daly Plaza last year. Oh gosh, that was I've an been experience. There times. That place is so much tinier than what I thought it would be. Like mm-hmm. you know, it's like really little when you're there but on the old footage the black and white it looked like it went on forever but when you're standing there it's it's, it's really not small it's yeah not. it's small so so for our audience who doesn't know like there's a lot of us that know what what is a late what is a latent print examiner a latent print examiner is a special person who looks for hidden fingerprints and he has to, de- to determine on which method to to develop those okay. prints with either powders or chemicals or super glue mm-hmm. And he, he has to know what he's doing. If a child's print, print is so fine, you have to work so fast and so easy with a child's print or you'll destroy it. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's what it is. He's trying to find the hidden fingerprints. Mm-hmm. Like yours on the table, though. Yeah, let me tell you an interesting fact. <laughs> if you look at my finger, every time I've gone to get fingerprints for a job, they can't get them. I, I just went and done that a few months ago. They can't. They couldn't get them because mm-hmm. my hands are so dry. And they asked me, do you use a lot of hand sanitizer? And I said, yeah. And the guy told me that he has nurses that come in that they can't pick up prints. I'm sure I have some. But look how slick because where my hands are the, so dry. The prints are there, but they're not three-dimensional. Yeah, yeah. They had a hard time. I mean, we done the rolling on mm. that thing, and they, they just wouldn't come up, and he had to put in like I tried. And mm. so, but, you know, mm. I, I said, man, I could probably get away with well, anything. <laughs> As long as you get two prints, you're good. Yeah, yeah, they can get my thumbs good, but that's, my, that's my fingers, yeah. That's so enough. I thought, man, I was like, I could probably get away with anything, <laughs> but I probably can't. So people like you would come find me. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so we talked about you developed an interest at 14. Mm-hmm. So from 14 to how old were you when you took that class, 17? I was 17. 17. So what did you do in the meantime? Well, I know you read a book. Um, I, forget I the read name. True Detective magazine True. from Jack Stewart's drugstore in <laughs> Yeah, so every you every one of them. <laughs> every one of, there's nothing out there in the schools, nothing. Yeah, wow. And I went to school uh, till eighth grade at Chestnut Hill up by Bush mm-hmm. Brothers, and they had a book in there, The FBI by John Whitehead. Yeah. I absorbed that book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read that about you. So, like I said, I, I think I feel like I kind of know you a little bit from all I've read about you, but I'm sure there's so much more I haven't even. I haven't scratched the surface. <laughs> so, but um, so you helped the National Forensics Academy. What is that, and where is that? I was the spark. I started it. Oh, you started it. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, you helped start it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, what? Where I've is been, that? I've been lecturing at the Forensic Academy in, uh, in in Virginia, and I came out of the, I came in one afternoon, and the chief asked me where I've been. I told him. He said. Well, get in my office in the morning. We might try that here. <laughs> so he said, why don't we do a Southeastern Forensic Academy? And then it got bigger and bigger and made the National Academy. So there's three of us actually put it together. Wow. Me and Phil Keith and Jackie Fish. Wow. And where is that at? It's in Oak Ridge now. Oak Ridge. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's not... It's part of UT. Yeah, that's just past Knoxville on the way to Nashville, right? So north of home. Oh, okay, yeah. Because I, I, I went to Nashville a few months ago, <clears throat> excuse me, and I saw that sign. I was like, Oak Ridge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I wonder if that's where the Oak Ridge boys are from, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Know. <laughs> anyway, um, so as we talked, you led the research in the chemical differences between so, children and adults. Yes. Um, yes. So explain to me, like, how, so... Was it just something that, I mean, I know you explained to me how you did that, but what caused, what prompted you to think like, there's a difference here. I just got to figure there was it no out. Answer. I was challenged. Oh, okay. And uh, it took about a year to, to figure out what was going on. And uh, in Oak Ridge had me determine what it was. And in 1995, I was keynote speaker at a world conference in Anaheim, California. I got to speak and they turned the lights down. I started talking, people were talking. They said interpreters are right with me. They didn't understand the ability. <laughs> so they came all over the world. I got a lot of reviews out of that one. Wow. Because, wow, we didn't know that. Yeah. And we have to be more careful with the children's fingerprints. Yeah, I would never have known that. I mean, you know, but I mean, listen, I watch stuff. What do you think about shows like Law and Order and all that stuff? Do you watch stuff like that? Or, or no. is it completely different no. than what you do? No. no, I don't watch any of that. No. Now I like Ducky. I like NCIS. It's always, Ducky yeah. Navy. Yeah, I like that, too. I, I do like it. I mean, it's so realistic. Sometimes I think I smell the body. Oh, wow. Really? Well, if you watch yeah. it, much, you'll see the body being opened up. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I always figure that's probably like some wax something. Or I don't know. Yeah. But it's pretty gross. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I do, I do like that show. I participate in over 500 autopsies. Oh, gosh. Wow. From children to old people. Oh, wow. And yeah. one police officer, one friend of mine got killed. Oh. I took the bullet out of his body. Wow. 
that has to be that has to be really tough. Yeah, it is. You know, I couldn't do something like that. My mom, she was a nurse uh, before she passed away, and she would always beg me and my sister when we were younger, go to nursing school. And I'm like, listen, I can't stand to see somebody spit, let alone bleed or like, you know, <laughs> like anything else. I, I couldn't like give shots or anything. So I couldn't imagine what you go through. I mean, and I always say that stuff is a calling. So is, for you to is. do that, that was a calling, you know. It wasn't just something it you is. were like, hey, I'm going to. I've been involved in eight plane crashes worldwide to recover human remains for identification. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in 1991, you began research on how to lift fingerprints from a corpse. Yes. I didn't even know that you yes. could actually get fingerprints yes. from a dead person, from skin, from flesh. Yes. So tell me the process about that and what prompted you to even start that? Well, I used to about 20 or 30 different processes that had been used around the world that didn't work. I thought maybe I could enhance those processes and didn't work and I turned to super glue and, and it started working and I kept refining it, refining it. I made the machine to heat it to 400 degrees and from, go from liquid to a gas and force the gas on the skin and that was a real big plus. And then I started getting fingerprints off of human skin. So and before that, nobody could lift a nope. print off of skin. So what was there a particular case that caused you to want to do that? Or the, the, the serial murders. The, serial murders. Yeah, the Zuman case. Oh, okay. All and all that was in Knoxville? Knoxville, yes. Wow. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, he worked at the zoo. He lived here on Pine Mountain. Oh, wow. Husky. Oh, wow. And uh, he was picking up prostitutes and killing them. We were still missing two, and they probably were in the barn that burned. Mm. And they then finally got him in, and, and uh, he got... 14 different personalities and all that stuff. So, oh, I mean, you know, it's one of those things with him. But anyway, he'll never be out of jail again in his life. Good. So I always thought there should be fingerprints on arms and legs. Yeah, that's... And it took a long time to get it. The best place to get fingerprints off a female is the leg below the knee. Wow. It's smooth skin. It's shaved. Yeah. It holds springs better. Wow. So... Yeah. In some places, the officers overlook the fingernails of the victim. They may be fingerprints on the fingernails. Oh, wow. Yeah, especially if they, like, fly mm -hmm. back or whatever. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's very that's very interesting. So I'm sure that now police all over the world used your... Mm -hmm. They do. Your, um, they do. I, the first two years, I uh, donated uh, diagrams for any officer to make if they wanted to. And after two years, they said, well, you want the real thing. So I started having... A, a man in Alcoda manufacturing for me, and I sold them all over the world. Wow. And the first major case that was used on a little girl in New Jersey, uh, Tim Trozzi of the FBI, he took one of my prototypes and donated to them. They flew him to New Jersey, and he processed a little girl in the field that had been kidnapped, raped, and murdered. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he got the suspect's palm print off her inner thigh. Oh, wow. That's Megan and Megan's law. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, wow. Well, I've heard of that. I've heard That's of that the nice law you have right now for child molester lives in your neighborhood. Yeah. Oh, she yeah. was the first. Wow. That's why they call it Megan's Law. Wow. So, you know what? Like I said before, like, to know that you've made such a contribution and to know that that your, your work that you developed, you know, your research, your patents, your devices and stuff can help put bad people away that has to feel you when you lay down at night you have to feel good about yourself i'm usually tired <laughs> <laughs> but I, I get the feeling you're very humble you don't want to toot your own no, horn do no, you i don't do no. that i don't do that I'm, I'm i'm truly blessed to be able to do what i'm doing at this age well you invented a device that can detect bones in unmarked graves um that is so interesting so tell us about that not the bones the energy field around the, the energy bones. oh okay and you can't create or destroy energy you know, the moment I die, my spirit's going to paradise. Mm -hmm. What happens that battery inside of me? Mm -hmm. It goes in the ground with the body, and it's there for, for eternity. Yeah. Only humans have it. And they not even primates that too have this energy field. Wow. So I have a, a device that I scan for that, and a second device within three to five seconds to have this male or female adult or yeah. child. Gosh. 99% accuracy. Right that is so fascinating. I know I keep saying the word amazing and fascinating, <laughs> but it is. I can't get over that. That, you know, these are things I wouldn't even think about. Like, well, I was challenged on that. Oh, okay. The old cemetery in downtown Danbridge, uh, uh, Sheila Evans, retired school teacher, historian, took me over there, and she showed me how she loads graves. She said, here's a rock, and we over there. Rock. Will we ever know if somebody buried in between those rocks? Mm. I bet you can find out. Yeah, so you'd like a challenge. So I went home and called Dr. Bass, Dr. Arpad Bass, Dr. Rick Snow, Googled it, nothing there, read the Bible, took long walks, hugged a tree or two, talked to my dog. <laughs> And the third morning, I woke up, I had answered. It was a gift to me. Oh, good. That's why I never charge for my service. Oh. Never. Yeah. If they want to give me guys money, that's fine. But I'll never charge for my time. Oh. It's okay. a gift to me, and I pay some to yeah. you. That is, that is so sweet of you. 
So you feel like that the Lord gave you that gift then. Yeah. So who is, you said Dr. Bass and Dr. Snow, or who are they? Uh, you, know, you know who Dr. Bass is. Doctor, no. Doctor. He's over the body farm, Dr. Bass. Oh, okay. Dr. Rick Snow said he got his master's there, and he goes all over the world with the National Center for Missing Exploited Children digging up graves of children who have been kidnapped and murdered. Oh, wow. Dr. Arpad Bass developed the, the device that uh, Kaylee Anthony case, and he mm -hmm. said that there'd been a body in the back of that car. Mm -hmm. They took him down there. Yeah. And the family kept saying it was a, it was a squirrel. Mm -hmm. He said, no. <laughs> and how he did that at, the, at UT, he got permission from one of the casket companies. He drilled holes in them. He collected the gases. He found two gases in the human. Mm -hmm. And he named them Peter C. and the cadaver Dean. Wow. So if he finds those two, then humans been there. You know what? I got to, I got to keep my mouth shut about that case because I got my opinions and I know that she went free. But oh, you know, <laughs> I can't say anything. But um, had I been a juror on that case, I probably would have voted entirely different because the evidence was all there. You know. But hey, whatever the jury said, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about your work at Ground Zero. You were yes. you were one of only six first responders in the whole state of Tennessee to yes. get called to Ground Zero the yes. day after 9-11. No, happened. we actually were activated about 4.30 that afternoon. Oh, wow. And they said, get everybody together you can in Tennessee. And so we met. We had three from the Nashville area, and Steve Tender and Fred Berry from Knoxville, Berry Funeral Home, and me. We met behind Berry Funeral Home on Chapman Highway. Mm -hmm. And by 6.30 the next morning, we were headed out. Wow. How long did you stay up there? 59 days. 59 days. Wow. So tell me what tell me what you were called for. Were you called for, I hate to say recovery, because was anybody recovered alive? I can't remember. That's been so long ago. Or was it just like? Not. It was not search and rescue, to, but yeah, maybe recovery. Yeah. I didn't get on the heap. That wasn't my job. As the, the firefighters would bring the human remains out, I would document where they got them. Oh, okay. The chain of custody. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's part of a uniform, those dignity and respect, they went out immediately in the ambulance to the medical center, the officer and police escort. Yeah. If there's no indication it was first responders, then we got four or five of them in the ambulance together. Wow. And I worked there two weeks, got sick, had to come home, and went back, and they put me in the medical center's office when the chief medical center found out what I'd done. He said, I need you to collect DNA evidence. So I started working with my DNA recovery yeah. team. That had to be so heartbreaking. I can remember, like, I remember the day it happened. You know, I was at work and I heard it on the radio. And then when I got home that evening, when I watched it on the news, it devastated me, just like it did everybody else all over the world. But how did it feel to actually be there during that time when all those ruins were there? I mean, it had to be. Like, I've gone to Ground Zero after, you know, after that. And just being there is, it's it's very um, humbling. It's very it sad. Is. It's a very it quiet is. place. It Nobody is. hardly talks. It is. So how did it feel to be there the, you know, the first time I went in, I went in with Steve. No, the next day I went with Steve. Uh, he was supposed to go in on day shift, and he got knocked off. Even on shift, I was first over a team to go into Ground Zero. Mm -hmm. And I walked out, Fred Murray walked out of the hotel with me, and he said, here's your ride, and, and New Jersey State Troopers, two men in the car, and I got in the back seat. Somebody else could, I don't have a clue who the other was. He said, fasten your seatbelt tight, we're going to fly. Boy, they did. Wow. Up on sidewalks, round cars, wow. just wide open. I said, buddy, don't have to get to that quick. And he said, I've got my orders. And he took me to a place. He, he knew where I was going. And he said, walk up that street to the light. And the, the temporary board was on the left there. So, so mm -hmm. I got out and went to, through shotgun checkpoints with my ID and walked in there. And they just, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Well, I was just retired police officer in Knoxville. We were all buddies then. And I talked a while and went on up to uh, the second story uh, Whoppers and got some gloves, a couple of things. Came back down, was standing there beside a big old track hole as he was gently getting the debris out. Mm -hmm. And all at once, the, uh, somebody yelled, and he just stopped. Big old lights on there, and I, I remember it sounded like the big old track hole just went down to nothing, probably sadly. And two people scrambled up, and they saluted something on the ground. They took a gurney up and loaded a part of a body, part of the uniform part of service, and brought it back down. We put it on the gator and took it down to medical center offices. And when I got there, I looked at the others, and there's tears coming. She, I mean, their face covered the dust. You see a flow marsh down there, and I did that. Yeah, it was a very sad time in it our was. country. Uh, you know, and uh, and I, like I said, uh, I told you that I watch all the stuff about JFK. I also watch a lot of documentaries about 9/11, and I just watched one the other night that I hadn't seen. I forget what it was called, but um, it was like three or four parts, and. Uh, it just brought all that back. It's mm -hmm. it's really hard to watch, even after what almost twenty 
three years now. Yeah. This September will be 23 years. It's still really hard to watch. Well, so. I do a program every year at the Alcatraz Crime Museum for them and yeah. uh, get a lot of response down there. So, so you've also worked on thousands of other violent mm -hmm. crime scenes, mm -hmm. um, along with, like we mentioned, the body farm and stuff. What was some of the, what was one of the worst you've ever seen? You don't have to go into detail, but what was one of the worst you've ever seen? What hits you the hardest? The kids? The kids. The kids. Yeah. And I was appointed deputy coroner for five years, and then we shot the coroner. He was a child molester. Oh no! Oh my goodness! And oh gosh! They had to arrest him. Had enough proof to get him. They pulled a gun. Got oh. shot. He died three years ago. Oh wow! Gosh! He's my boss. He's a he's a good soul, but boy, he likes little boys. Oh gosh, that's so heartbreaking. It really is. sad, it's, you know. It's lost to society because he was so brilliant. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Some people hide in plain sight. I mean, they really do, mm -hmm. and it's really sad. So I mentioned the body farm, and I do want to kind of veer off topic just a second. You were a character in one of Patricia Cornwell's books. I've mentioned her on my show before because mm -hmm. I, I, I have loved her books since I was young. I used to, years ago when my son was little and I was a stay-at-home mom, you know, I had time to read them. <laughs> and I would run out and get her books. Every time one would come out, I would run out and get her books. And you were actually a character in her book called The Body Farm. You were Dr. Katz. How did that feel, the big character in a book? Well, after I came back from that conference at Tacoma called the FBI Academy, I called Bass the next day and I said, Patricia Cornwell wants to come down and she wants to set up research going to be used in the book. And he said, okay. <laughs> And so we got together the next day or the next day after that and uh, started planning it and built a box, a plywood box, uh, eight foot long, four foot high and four foot wide and put a body in it. Mm -hmm. And we put different metals under the body and on the body, see how it would tattoo. Mm. And some of them tattooed the body as it deteriorated, some wow. didn't. The stainless steel didn't. So we were shocked, that's, you, that's what she was in the book. And yeah. then she got in the book using a super glue. Yeah, 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 that's so cool. It's mm -hmm. so it's really cool that you were, you know, and I, and I was telling you earlier before we even started that I just think it's interesting that I read a book that you were, the character was based on you many, many years ago. And here we are today, like sitting down for an interview. You never know where life's going to take you, no, you, you know, know, you just never know. So, um, so you're also a writer as well. We're yes. going to talk all about Patricia Cornwell, but yes. show me some of the books that you've written and then let's talk about them. Well, this is the, uh, Grace Creek Baptist Church. I've got four volumes. I got one more to go. And I actually went through fifty thousand pages and condensed it down to about five hundred. Oh wow! Of some of the records. And this is this is my story. This is my biography. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's done real well. I sold two hundred in the last year. Oh wow, that's great! Yeah, I saw that on Amazon. Prince of a Man. And you told me that if you you want to share about what the whose fingerprint that is, or yeah, it's my son's. The right thumbprint. I yeah. made my logo in 1990, yeah. and he was killed 2004 as a UT police officer yeah. got run over killed by a semi. So that, I'm, I think that's so, you know, that's so great that you that you'll always have that, you mm -hmm. know. So yeah. So this is his book, Prince of a Man, his biography. If you want to get that, that's actually on Amazon, and we will include all the links um, to your yeah, Amazon yeah. and stuff like that at the end of the show. Now this is a, a historical fiction series. My grandfather fought in the American Revolution, mm -hmm. but that's book 13. This is book 12. Oh, wow. And I brought my son back to fight in the American Revolution with the sheriff in Jefferson County, Jeff Coffey. Oh, wow. So they're both in this book. Oh, okay, cool. So book 12 and 13. Mm -hmm. So Henry Bohannon's Journey. You know what? I saw that. Okay, so there's a Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah, and I saw that. I saw yeah. this picture on there. Well, and you've, you're a prolific I, writer. I, I, want a, I want about face in the file. And this is a science fiction Oh. Bert and Julie, part of our team, were deployed on Easter Slope. The Rockies asteroid was getting ready to hit. And it hit near Bert and Julie and threw them back into the Bronze Age. Oh, wow. So how do they survive in the Bronze Age? Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Where are we, Bert, surviving in the Bronze Age? Now, that sounds like something I could get into. <laughs> so. I never write just one book. There's got to be a sequence to that. <laughs> and uh, this is the, the book. Tell them the details on how those oh, are Oh, yeah. You know what? I, I really I have to get this. Who are you walking on? We never know, do we? Graveyard Forensics. And I got a whole box full more over here. Yeah. So how many books have you written all together? 20. 20. Wow. Do you write them yourself or do you have a ghostwriter? I write them. Them. I do. I'm a writing. Oh, that's amazing. You know what? I'm a writer, too. I've, I've got eight books out. But me and Amy actually were ghostwriters for a company, and we wrote like 16, 17 together. So... If you ever need a ghostwriter, <laughs> I, I do my own writing. I've, I've changed editors and ladies that formatted twice because the last one, and uh, when this one came out, 
uh, who you're walking on the proof it had 30 some mistakes in it oh wow and she's yeah. just sitting down i'm trying to find an, i think another editor that does editing formatting yeah. for me yeah but uh this one is uh i don't like the format in it the page the flyings are too far apart mm. but i'll live with it yeah you know what hey you got some books out though <laughs> that's what matters so yeah i'm working on 21 and 22 i do work on two at the same time yeah, so I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you before we wrap up, what's next for you? So you got two more books. What else do you have? They're probably 16, in, 16 to 18 in a series. I'm on book 13 now, oh, okay. 13. So probably 18 in the series. Yeah. So so you're retired from all of your cop work and all that, or I'm sorry, your police work and all that, but you haven't slowed down, have you? <laughs> no, <laughs> you're and, still... and to locate graves. Yeah. That's my big one now, especially to locate the veterans so they can be identified yeah. and marked. Yeah. Listen, veterans, I'm, you know, my whole family was full of veterans and stuff, so that's really the, near and dear to my the heart. The one I did New Year's Day, I opened the Alcoa Highway, when I told them I got six adult males in a row, and I, think, I said, I think these are soldiers from the Battle of uh, Fort Sanders. Mm -hmm. And I kept going, adult male, adult male, got up to 14. Wow. And they were just shocked. Wow. And they were so glad to identify that in their backyard. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Are you still lecturing too? Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. good. Good. I go to Mar to uh, court and senior citizens mm -hmm. in Knox County lecture. Oh, good. And then I've got two or three a month. Yeah. And you were just over here at Alcatraz East back in September. September. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't get a chance to go to that, but I, I saw that you were there. That's interesting. And I'll be so. doing one in the spring at the library down here too. Okay. Uh, at the uh, King Memorial yeah. or King, yeah. no. King Family. No, the one here, Pigeon Forge. Oh, okay. And I'll be doing my life week. Okay. The 23rd, I believe, and then I'll be doing uh, Rose Glen and, and Sevierville, yeah. uh, 24th, I believe, February. Yeah, well, listen, you have led a very interesting life. You have done amazing work. You have given so much to society, and, you know, for that, I'm grateful, and I know that everybody else is, too. I, I and just wish I'd kept my focus years ago. Yeah. I have too many distractions in life. Really? Wow. But look at all you've done, though. Well, you yeah, know? I'm blessed. Truly can't blessed. Downplay what, you can't downplay your accomplishments truly because you're blessed. a great man. Truly blessed. Thank yeah. you. So, well, I want to thank you once again for coming on my show. I have. It's been amazing for me to sit down and talk to you, and I appreciate it so you much. You have more questions. Can. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll have more questions. So, yeah. So, um, thank you guys for joining me today. I know you've enjoyed listen to Arthur as much as I have and um, stay tuned for another great episode next week and remember to always dream big because big dreams do come true. They do. It's little hands that make a big splash. A little bit of pride after a great big slide. It's a little family time, a little bonding and all the biggest laughs. It's the little things that make the biggest impressions. Wilderness. A big world made up of little moments. Plan your vacation at wildernessatthesmokies.com.